Welcome to Greenable Woodbridge. I'm your host, Carolyn Ehrlich, and today's topic is trees and why they're so important to our township. So we have uh, our local expert with us, Jeff Tandel, who works with Enviro Mentors, and he's a landscape architect, which is perfect for this kind of job, and that's why we are in this beautiful setting here at Merrill Park. So, um, Jeff, you know, um, let's start off by talking about how you got involved with the township. Okay, well, I'll tell you a little bit of my background first. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from Rutgers College and a Bachelor of Science degree in Landscape Architecture from Cook College, which is also part of Rutgers, and a Master's degree in Architecture from NGIT. Um, I wanted to combine all of the design professions, and it's important to have a business background, so that's kind of how I got uh, my education. Um, the last several years, about eight years, I've been working as a part-time uh, seasonal forester for New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Division of Parks and Forestry, and working on everything from Cool Cities, which was a tree planting program to reduce energy costs, uh, No Net Loss, which is uh, where state projects come through, say the New Jersey Turnpike, and they're widening mm -hmm. um, tree program. In fact, uh, Woodbridge had benefited from that. We just recently did a project that was completed um, in several of the parks. And um, so during Cool Cities, I actually worked in Linden, Rawway, Carteret, and Woodbridge primarily, but also all over the state. So I got to know Woodbridge pretty well and really impressed with the number of parks and the quality that you have here. Thank you. And I know you've been very helpful to us with our community forestry program. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something about us getting trees mm -hmm. and we had a grant. How many? Uh, it, was a, it was approximately 139 trees from the No Net Loss program. It was a roadway improvement. And the way those No Net Loss programs work is um, the money either goes towards planting on site if they can. If not, it goes to the surrounding affected communities. Um, they've changed the way the funding works a little bit now. That money is now going to go into what they call CSIP grants, which is the Community Stewardship Incentive Program. Uh, if you are a no net loss affected town, you get first priority and mm -hmm. will get a higher ranking in your grant application. And the CSIP grants can be used for tree planting, but they can also be used for a number of the other uh, activities um, that are part of your management plan. Okay, let's, um, we're going to come back to this, mm -hmm. but the most important thing I think for our residents to realize is why the trees are so important to us. Well, there's a lot of benefits to trees, and uh, these are in no particular order uh, because you can, at any given time, one might be more important than another. Um, but first of all, they provide aesthetic beauty, but they are really important to life on Earth in general. And I don't want to sound like a born-again hippie from the 60s. I'm not quite that <laughs> there's old. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, however, um, it really is important to our life uh, on, on Earth because of the hydrologic cycle. And if you go back to your third grade science book, mm -hmm. they used to show that image of a tree and the through evapotranspiration, they pull up water through the roots that goes back out into the atmosphere and you create the rain cycle. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the trees and vegetation, that would not happen. So there are a lot of other benefits to trees. They provide shade, they reduce uh, air conditioning costs in the summertime, but trees can also reduce energy costs in the wintertime. People don't realize it. If you place evergreens on the northwest side of buildings, it prevents wind. Um, ball fields also, again, makes them more playable during more parts of the year. And if you have evergreens near your house, it actually creates what they call a boundary layer, which is a fancy scientific term for slow or non-moving air, so you create an insulation around your house. Interesting. Um, other benefits include people don't realize that trees add value to their property. Studies show anywhere from 10 to 40 percent um, to property value. Um, trees are important to our general health, mental and physical well-being. Um, studies have shown that people who work in the garden and around trees and go to green spaces frequently have lower incidence of depression. Um, people in hospitals, they've done studies where people were looking at blank roofs and asphalt parking lots. The people who looked out on green spaces had fewer complications after surgery. They were released days earlier, uh, lower pain medication, and in general, better overall health. Um, there's actually, I have a friend who does Alzheimer gardens, um, mm -hmm. and there are plants put out there that help 
these Alzheimer patients actually remember through scents and sounds and the feel of the foliage. Oh, that is wonderful. Um, other things they do is um, generally reduce crime, uh, tree-lined uh, streets. You know, every time you hear something terrible happens on the news, oh, the tree-lined streets of such and such a town was you know, disrupted. And so there's a, there's a psychological feeling that tree-lined streets um, are a better place to live. Um, some of the other benefits are uh, for stormwater management. Um, th they are big pumps, essentially big water pumps. They pump up hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, especially on hot sunny days. So when we have a rainfall, I was actually up in Sussex County the other day when we had some of those downpours and I was out in the woods and it was pouring and I didn't get wet for 10 minutes. It took a long time before that water actually reached you mm -hmm. because the trees slow it down, they hold on to the water, so it's a, it's a nature's detention basin. Um, my favorite thing is my good friend Mike DeRico, who was a supervising forester and now retired from DEP, used to say is it's putting a, a machine in the ground that cleans the air. Um, we live in New Jersey. We have lots of air pollution here, unfortunately. Um, not only does it process chemicals, but it also um, takes particulates out of the air. and holds those particulates, so we're mm -hmm. not breathing them in. It actually filters the air. And then also produces oxygen, which is beneficial. So in all works of life. So some people, though, unfortunately, you know, if they're elderly or they just want to minimize where everybody's so busy with all their jobs and the mm -hmm. kids, they just want to minimize how much work they have to do around their home, will think to cut down a tree so they don't have to rake the leaves. Right. And to me, that's like, please figure out a way to deal with it because the leaves are beautiful too. Right, and there, there's many opportunities either, you know, we all need exercise, myself included, so get out there and rake the leaves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have leaf backpack blowers, um, which work very well. I like to use my lawnmower to pick up the leaves, especially when they first start falling. You grind them up, put them in the bag, and then use them as mulch. Um, the people who want, don't want to rake the leaves are the same people who rake them, you know, put them in the plastic body bags out on the street, right. and then they go to Home Depot and they buy a bunch of fertilizer and mulch, and it's like, hey, you had free mulch. Mm -hmm. um, look at the woods sometimes. It's all regenerated, and there's sort of a purpose to the leaves falling. Um, I'm in favor of reduction of lawn area. Again, going back to stormwater management, which is becoming more and more of an issue since we've had these these increasing number of extreme events. I um, mean, look at Sandy, Irene, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to reduce runoff. We need to recharge our aquifers, and you need base flow and streams. Um, the old engineering way of thinking of things was, oh, we'll channelize it, move the water through faster. Um, you really want that base flow in the stream. It's really important for the health of the, of mm -hmm. the stream. So you're actually saying plant more trees and less grass. Yes. Um, and you can have a balance. Um, if you have landscaped areas, you can, like I said, chop the leaves up with your lawnmower um, and then place them there. That's, that's what I try to do. Um, in my town, we actually have a good pickup system. I think you guys do also mm -hmm. for leaf uh, pickup. Right. Um, so uh, another opportunity is hire some kids. Um, they say kids don't want to work, but believe me, they want money for gas and whatever. Um, so you know, maybe you can get a couple of neighborhood kids to come out and help. And, Another idea is, you know, get some volunteer groups like maybe the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts uh, or whatever type of volunteer and make an agreement with a local business or industry and say, hey, listen, our, our people want to go out and rake some leaves for some elderly and infirm people. How about donating so many dollars per hour spent? Um, and it's a win-win situation for everybody. That's a good idea. So I want to go back to something that you had mentioned earlier in the introduction about the community forestry plan mm -hmm. because uh, we work hard to be part of that program and it has as hard as we work I, we the township gets the benefits back so if you could talk about what that entails and how it benefits Woodbridge sure uh, it's a uh, we at DP we're calling it the CFMP which is the community forestry management plan um, I was actually a little bit instrumental in that getting started because when Good I met you. Mike Dorico many many years ago um, you know I was kind of banging my head against the wall because I can I was still in school um, when I got involved in my town with with trees and uh, the council people was, oh, I'm gonna get some calls and it's like you know you really need to look at what you're doing with your program um, you need to start planting you know more diversity of trees 
um, and the right tree in the right place. And so Mike DeRico came along, this little guy, and I was like, he speaks my, my language because he talks about the same things. And we were discussing, you know, you have a master plan for planning and development in, in every town in New Jersey. And I said, why can't you have something similar for the community forestry? And eventually that got developed. The benefits are, first of all, you have a plan. And I always tell people, even from a little residential project, do a master plan. Even if you don't do it all at once, you have mm -hmm. a plan. Because you never know where funding is going to come from. And typically, when funding comes up from a grant or whatever other opportunity, you say, oh my God, we're going to plant some trees, where are we going to put them? Well, if you have the plan, you got a spot to place them. Um, the other huge benefit for towns is um, what happened with a lot of the shade tree commissions, they were being disbanded for a while and it was a liability issue, um, kind of misguided. Um, the idea of having a shade tree commission and tree department is good because you're actively monitoring your, your urban forest and taking care of hazard trees and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, there was legislation in place that was protecting volunteers, and that would be people, you know, volunteer for, uh, say, to coach Little League, and somebody gets hurt. Well, all of a sudden, you're being sued and you're losing your house. They said, we can't have this because people are not going to volunteer for anything. Unfortunately, Shade Tree Commissions were left out of that group. Mm -hmm. um, later, through efforts of DEP and others in the industry, they said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we have all these volunteers on Shade Tree Commissions. We really need to protect them. So. In order to get that liability protection, you have to have an approved management plan. And you have to do that every five years. So um, there's also benefits if you apply for grants from the state. Typically, mm -hmm. um, there's a higher standing in the grant ranking if you if you have a plan. I think they are actually switching over to it being mandatory that you do have to have a plan. That's good. Great thing is it's not one of these state here go do this, but you got to pay for it. They do have grants available, three thousand dollar grants, so you can hire a consultant if you don't have the in-house capability to do right. it. So, and we have brought you on as a consultant, but mm -hmm. you know, even though your expertise is in the the forestry plan, you have another expertise that we so badly needed right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're talking about all this wonderful um, with the trees and and how beautiful they are and how helpful they are, but. Unfortunately, even trees get sick and yes. get afflicted. And we have our an affliction that's almost nationwide, I think, mm. that's hitting Woodbridge. So if you want to talk a little bit about the emerald ash borer, and sure. then we're going to get up and we're going to go find an ash tree and show everybody what they need to look for in their yards. Yeah, the, uh, there's, there's a number of diseases and insects out there that are problematic. I'll talk about the emerald dash borer uh, first because that's the most current problem right now. Um, it's a introduced uh, invasive and or non-native invasive. And the reason they call it that is because our weather or climate patterns do seem to be changing. We do seem to be getting warmer, uh, particularly on the, on the East Coast. Um, so for example, Southern Pine Beetle, which used to be a Southern problem down in Texas and Georgia and states like that, has actually moved up into New Jersey. Now that is a native pest, but normally would not go North. This was introduced from China or some, somewhere in Asia, um, probably through some uh, wood that was transported here um, from pallet wood. It's similar to the Asian longhorn mm -hmm. beetle. The problem with the emerald ash borer is it's not quite as lazy as the <laughs> Asian longhorn beetle. It has a much wider range. It will move around. Um, as with all of these pests, you want to make sure that you're not moving firewood. Um, you really want to stay within a 50 mile radius of wherever it's been discovered. Um, I don't know whether it's out west yet, but I know that it started in Ohio and it's been moving eastward. The firewood moving is a big thing because they found areas, and it was the same thing with the Asian longhorn beetle, all of a sudden there's an infestation like miles and miles away from the, the, the original site. You say, well, how did they get there and why did they skip over it? It's because someone had transported the wood there. Let's go take a look at some trees and um, you can show us, you know, what to look for okay. and how they're damaged. Sure. The Department of Public Works Tree Division has been very proactive trying to find the ash trees that have been infected by the emerald ash borer. And this is one of the trees that they have identified. 
So we're going to, um, Jeff is going to explain to us what the signs are to look for and um, to talk about, you know, if you have an ash tree on your property, what are you going to do if you find one? The answer to that question is you can call Public Works, they can give you advice, they can come out and look at it. On private property, they can't remove it. But you need to remove it and you actually need to have a certified tree company do that because there's a specific way, as Jeff will explain, of getting rid of that wood. So Jeff, show us the symptoms and the cure is kind of okay. killing. But <laughs> yeah, I, you know, there, there are some options. Uh, we're looking at removal and replacement, um, which I think is gonna be an option for a lot of towns just because of the cost. If you have your prize tree that your grandmother planted and it's not way up there in age, um, there are treatments you can do. The problem is they are expensive. It's $150 to $250 or more per treatment, and it depends on the caliper of the tree. The larger the tree, obviously, the more expensive. And I would imagine how how early in the process you well, catch it. Right. It, and, and, and but you this tree is well this beyond tree is repair. Gone. This is yeah. totally dead, unfortunately. Um, you need The earlier in the process, the better. The problem is with the emerald ash borer when it first appears is you don't see it right away. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to detect partially because it starts up in the top of the tree. So unless you're doing an aerial inspection, you're not going to see the exit holes, which are these D-shaped exit holes, and you're not going to see adults flying around or emerging. Um, timing of the treatment, again, I'm going to refer to the licensed tree experts because as my friend uh, Dr. Neil Hendrickson says, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Right. And you really have to look at the specific case of, first of all, is it worthwhile to treat the tree? What some towns are doing out west, because in Ohio they got hit really fast, really hard, is they're treating some trees but only to stave off the uh, infestation for a while, then they're going to have to come back and do removals, unfortunately. Um, disposal of the wood, um, we do have to check with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Right now, generally, you don't want to move it outside of a 50-mile radius. You also don't want to move it into an area that has not been infested, so you want to try to main take it to a, a disposal site. Um, the internal wood actually can be used for lumber because the, the insect is out in the cambium layer, which is just below the surface of mm -hmm. the tree. If it does have the disease, and ash trees in general need to be taken down quickly. And one of the reasons I have a hard hat on is they're very, very brittle in general. When the insect gets in here, what it's doing, it's creating these galleries, these S-shaped galleries underneath the cambium. So it's, it's corrupting the vascular system of the tree, and that's why you're seeing, one of the reasons you're seeing die back from the top down is, is that, but also they're in the top of the tree. And what happens is the tree becomes incredibly desiccated, which means it's, it's very, very dry. Ash is a very straight grain wood, great for firewood because it splits real easily, mm -hmm. um, nice for furniture and other things, but that also makes it extremely brittle because it's so dry. Even the act of cutting branches when you're working from a bucket, the shaking around of the tree and the vibrations can cause a tree to collapse. So if, you, if you're aware of the problem, get it down quickly, get it done by a certified professional. Um, for private property in New Jersey, we have a licensed tree expert program. It used to be the certified tree experts. They are now fully licensed. They do have to have a license to do uh, uh, diagnosis and treatments. Um, you need to have a licensed tree care operator because the thing that happens, Sandy Happen, Irene, you have unfortunately a lot of charlatans who run around there, hey, I want to take your tree down. Mm -hmm. And some of those are fear mongers. Uh, with the ash, you do have to be careful, as I said. You want to get it down early, but you don't want, you want professional advice. Mm -hmm. um, don't go by price alone either, because the cheapest guy is not always the best. You want right. to make sure that they're, they're highly qualified. Right, that's not how you would right. choose your doctor. So <laughs> this tree is a little hard to tell the symptoms because it's, it's totally dead. But normally what you're going to see is you're going to start to see die back from the top of the tree. Mm -hmm. You may see what they call epicormic or water sprouts coming up from the base of the tree. Generally, whenever you see that, a tree is under stress. Um, and usually it means sometimes a root problem or vascular problem. So when you start to see that on the ash, that's something to be aware of. Again, the D-shaped scar. Now, the other confusing thing is there are a number of domestic borers that are more or less uh, destructive than the emerald ash borer, and they look very much alike. Um, I've actually done some research myself because I'm trying to figure out, you know, there's all these others, there's, there's several others that look similar. 
uh, you almost have to wash the insect off with the solution that they use in the laboratory to, to identify it because, mm. you know, the dirt and its soot gets on it. And if you see pictures of ones that have just emerged, they look very similar. There's two-line chestnut borer and a bunch of others I won't, I won't get into detail on. Um, so you really need to have an expert come out and take a look at it. Um, you need to identify an ash tree, first of all. Um, ash tree has a compound leaf. What that means is if you look at a maple tree and you look for where the bud is, it's mm -hmm. right at the base of what they call the petiole, which is the stem. Right. An ash tree has multiple what they call leaflets. So if you look at those leaflets, you're not going to see any bud at the base of those petioles. Mm -hmm. You move further down the stem, the leaf is actually this big kind of triangular shaped set of leaflets. So it's a compound leaf. Mm -hmm. There are other trees that look similar. Um, if you, we're going to post some things on the website in terms of another website rather than going through all that here, I think it'll be a little less confusing. Um, that looks at some similar trees. Walnut is one of the similar trees, but we don't have a lot of walnuts. Right. Um, but to the untrained eye, um, they might mistake it. Once you've seen an ash and you learn to identify it, it's, it's pretty easy. It has a very distinctive bark, a very distinctive shape and, and leaf. And Another thing that I read was that if there's a lot of woodpecker activity? Yes. Um, if you have an excessive amount of woodpecker activity, that probably means that there are some type of borer in the tree and you, you do need to address it. Okay, that's a good clue Yes, for people. Um, the other thing I want to suggest is if you're hiring a private contractor, several things you want to check. References, obviously, but you want to make sure that they're a licensed tree expert registered with the state and that you get a certificate of insurance from them. Mm -hmm. And the certificate of insurance should be specifically for tree work because, again, you'll have a lot of contractors who are doing ground landscape work. They will get a landscape contractor's insurance right. and they're doing climbing. Two very different things, two very different liabilities. You want to make sure that you have that, that they're insured. God forbid somebody gets hurt or they damage property. Right. Uh, you want to make and sure I think it's also insured. important to point out that this just infects ash trees. So if you have a beautiful maple tree, you don't right. have to worry about this jumping over to right your maple. Right now, it appears that it's strictly to the ash tree. Um, I just want to mention too, as people ask about biological control, uh, that's one of the things, first things that came to my mind. Um, there is no real uh, predator here for the emerald ash borer, unfortunately. And even if you were to introduce something, it's always tricky because... You got another. Well, it's not just that. You have a very high population of the insect. The predator comes in, it dines on the insect, maybe wipes it down or knocks down the population. So now, if that's their primary food, now their population declines and the other one goes up. Right. And right now, the, you know, there's other invasive pests back to going back to the 1800s. It's the gypsy moth. You can treat that with biologicals, um, and they have had some success, again, with, with putting out wasps and certain other things. Um, but again, it's that you have that fluctuation, and then there's also a fungus that now seems to affect the, uh, the gypsy moth, so you'll have these crashes and rises in, in population, but we don't have that for the emerald ash Okay, borer. well, let's get out of the way and let our okay. tree crew do their work.
Thank you, Jeff. This is a very interesting show. And thank you, everybody, for being on the lookout and being observant as we look for the emerald ash borer. Thank you for watching Greenable Woodbridge and being part of the change and part of the excitement.